Well, Rike, thank you so much for being here. Um, BCFG is uh, so honored to have Ulrike Momondier join us. There were so many awards on her CV, I decided instead of reading any of them, I would just say that um, her work is especially getting a lot of attention uh, now uh, during the pandemic, and I was um, reading The Economist and like stumbled across uh, mention uh, of her work. I know that's just gonna make a cameo appearance in today's presentation, but Lurike, without further ado, um, I'm excited for you to share your slides and we'll have 20 minutes of presentation followed by 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. And as Katie uh, Milkman just suggested, we will have that uh, just by doing the Q&A function um, uh, through Zoom. So thank you, Lurike, I'm looking forward to your talk. Great. Well, thank you so much, guys, for having me. I re I'm really excited to talk to you guys. I did originally think this would be um, more of a, um, you know, academic, let's just talk about the standard errors and identification kind of talk. But um, Katie um, told me, like, there's a really broad audience, which is super exciting. So let me use this opportunity to talk a little bit more broadly about this research agenda. Um, my co-authors and I are working on, on how our Lifelong experiences and our daily exposure to different signals changes our beliefs and our decision making. And I, I want to start from what is more the, you know, by now I guess you can say traditional behavioral economics, right? We established now, they love the Nobel Prize. So, so I start with the traditional, traditional economics and the usual contrast you may have seen in these and other seminars. So traditionally, behavioral economists distinguish themselves from the traditional the, the neoclassical, let's say, um, economic decision-making models where people have, you know, these stable beliefs, um, um, stable preferences, form Bayesian beliefs, rational beliefs, and have perfect cognition. And that's maybe our, you know, let's say, homo economicus. And then a behavior economist like me come in and say, well, this is not very realistic. All of these uh, fundamental assumptions need some more psychological realism. So instead of just maximizing your payoff, you know, you care about ethics, moral, truth, etc. Instead of forming Bayesian beliefs, you might think this, the, the pawn is a king and, and be overconfident. And most certainly we don't have perfect cognition, we have limited attention, limited memory, etc. And that's, well, I don't know what kind of homo that is, homo sap sapiens, you know, I'm not so sure how sapiens he is. But instead of kind of drawing these conflicts but, uh, between, say, rational beliefs versus overconfident beliefs, et cetera, which I think are super important, and we still need more of those, I kind of want to disrupt the dichotomy just for a second and think about how dynamically we change over the course of our lives. So whether you're more in the super homo economicus camp or more in the behavioral camp, one piece thing, one big thing that I feel is missing is the, like more of an acknowledgement that who we are changes throughout our lives as we are accumulating experiences. I'm gonna use here this um, cartoon from the Great Depression to which I will um, uh, refer back to shortly, uh, you know, about this guy here walking along life and then kaboom, um, fear is hitting him, fear from the Great Depression. And you know, he walks out of that experience being altered. And um, in fact, if you think about where experience comes from, some of you know I have this big love for Latin and ancient Greek, right? It comes from that beautiful Latin deponens, experiri, and that just means, you know, ire, you're walking per, through something and you come out differently. And that um, aspect is just something that doesn't pop up in you know, the, any policy making, fed, and of course, academic um, um, decision-making kind of models. In fact, as I like mentioned here at the bottom, even the word expert comes from experiere. So it's clearly something important, like accumulating experience throughout your life is something we think is important and it still doesn't feature very much, whether it's in behavioral models or in traditional models. Um, so traditional models, you know, have basically no room for personally experienced outcomes to affect you differently from information about these outcomes. If you live through a depression, that won't affect your financial decision-making any differently from reading about it and learning these kind of stock market outcomes can happen. Of course, that is controlling for the usual factors, wealth, income, age, et cetera, et cetera. But once we've controlled for them, in our traditional models and actually in, in, in much of our behavioral models, we think, you know, we are good. And that's what we want to challenge. We want to, with these new models of experience-based learning, we want to account for the fact 
that personal experiences affect us differently and more strongly from information about these outcomes, that there's some kind of rewiring happening and happening to everybody. It's not a question of intelligence or education. Even experts are being rewired by what they've seen all around them throughout their lives so far. So here's the famous example from, you know, which I actually personally started my research agenda here, joined with uh, Stefan Nagel, um, which focused on or was motivated by the Great Depression. Um, so, you know, famously in the US, um, there's this notion that people who lived through the Great Depression were confronted with these kind of headlines they saw here and the, the, the economic outcomes happening at the time were altered forever became very risk averse, avoided the stock market and all things risky like the plague, as this quote here says. And indeed, in our research, we find that's the case, that like decades later, you can trace um, a huge aversion towards any kind of stock market investment to that exposure to the really bad outcomes of the Great Depression. So rather than kind of showing you regression tables, here's just some kind of histogram um, this, which illustrates it. It shows people from their mid-30s to their mid-40s, 36 to 45, um, by a cohort. So first one is cohort born up to 1920, then 21 to 30, 31 to 40, et cetera, et cetera, as you go more and more to the right. And what you can see is that the generation that experienced the 1930s Great Depression as teenagers, adults, um, have a stock market participation, you know, invest that the fraction of those who invest at least one dollar in the stock market is 13 percent. And that's significantly lower than all other courts, which are at least 26 percent to, you know, 35, 37 um, at the end of that of that data set. And and then you also see it's not only about the Great Depression. You also see if you go to the second um, that I use the the spotlight thingy here, yeah. Um, the, if you go to, to the right, uh, to, to, to the right, you see the 31 to 40 cohort, which experienced the post-World War boom years during their young adult years. And they have a participation rate that's um, um, more than twice as high. Then you see, again, a little dip um, consistent with these people uh, experiencing the recession years of, of the 1970s. So of course, the paper is all about showing that in more detail, but the idea is, having personally being exposed to these bad outcomes affects you differently from somebody who just learns, well, outcomes like these can happen. Um, so that was one application, stock market expectations and stock market investment. Um, let me turn to, to our fears about inflation and about price changes, which is uh, most closely related to the main um, results I want to talk about today. Um, you know, um, these are pictures from German history textbooks uh, people like me grow up with. You have people playing with these bundles of notes here. And, um, you know, there is this question whether Germans who are famously concerned about inflation at all times, probably still right now, but that's, you know, not a thing we observe very much happening in the real world, that this kind of long lasting fear and aversion to inflation might be traced back to the hyperinflation Germany lived through um, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but you don't only need to go to Germany. Um, also here in the US, it's really interesting to see both at the height and at the low end of inflation, how um, policymakers really worry about generations of people who grow up seeing inflation and nothing but inflation, as Paul Volcker says here, yeah, during the time of the very high inflation in the US in the 1970s, peaking in 1980, whether there's any hope that, you know, he can convince these people to ever believe that he's working on getting back to price stability. And then vice versa, right now, we are, where we're at the low end, you know, you have people like Jay Powell, and, and there are similar quotes from Draghi and, uh, and now Lagarde, worried about um, as you see inflation moving down, expectations move down, and once everybody is there on that road, it's really, really hard to get them off that road again. We don't want to get on that road. So something about people taking in the experience around themselves above and beyond objective information they get, get about measures being taken, um, um, stimulations, um, um, st uh, stimulation measures being applied to the economy. And what we've shown in research is that these policymakers are exactly right. That what people have seen all around them in terms of the price signals in their daily lives does stick to them for a while and just gets more weight 
than any, you know, formal announcements of policy measures and interest rate setting, etc. So here's a graph to illustrate that. Um, it's just a little complicated, bear with me uh, uh, for a second. This comes from the Michigan Survey of Consumers where people are asked, um, you know, over the next year, do you think prices will go up, will go down or stay the same? And if you say up or down, by, by how much? And so basically one year inflation. And so, um, you know, people sometimes pretty crazy belief, but the mean or median person answering um, this question is typically pretty close actually to the, to the real inflation rates that will, you know, exposed be realized. Now I'm not showing that here. I'm, I'm splitting up the survey respondents answers by age groups. So the black guys are below 40 and red is 40 to 60 and blue is above 60. So younger, a middle age and older generation. And I'm not showing the answer, I'm showing the demeaned answer. So I'm taking out, you know, the mean answer people gave at that point in time. So as you can imagine, around 1970 to 1980, everybody was having higher and higher worries about in price increases as this was the period of really high inflation. Um, but I'm taking that out, I'm just showing the cross-sectional differences, I'm subtracting it. And so this illustrates what I want you to see, that um, people at times differ hugely in what they believe. So the young were really, really worried about inflation and had about three percentage points higher inflation expectations than the above 60 in 1980. So that's interesting. It's also interesting to see that that's not always the case. It's not an age question. Sometimes um, older people, the um, above 60 generation has higher inflation expectations and it keeps reverting over time and sometimes you're further apart or not. How can we explain that? That's something economists have for a long time ignored because they always just took the median and mean and were fitting their data. Well, you can explain it with lifetime experiences. If you pretty much take the birth year of everybody in this, in this, in this data and calculate um, their experience-based inflation belief. So roughly speaking, you take an average of what has happened over their lifetime so far in terms of inflation with linearly declining weight. So most weight to what happened recently and less and less going backwards. And it's a little bit comp more complicated to implement because inflation has this AR1 process type um, um, features. But roughly speaking, that's, that's what you need to do. And then you get these lines I'm drawing now through, through my dots, like these solid, dashed, and more dotted lines. And they do a pretty good job at getting these cross-sectional differences. No surprise that the young were so pessimistic at a time when um, you know, they had seen nothing but inflation all their life. Why people above 60? Well, they didn't like the high inflation in the 1970s, 1980s, but they'd seen other times. They were hopeful that Volcker would really put an end to it. And therefore they were less overreacting to it. So that's another aspect how these um, experiences matter. Now, one more important thing, you know, often in behavioral economics, we tend to think, oh, it's particular, the individual investor, the individual consumer, but certainly not the professionals who display this kind of non-standard behavior. And I'm here to tell you that we all, and I know there are many experts here among the audience, are affected by our personal experiences. Here's my favorite example. His name is Henry Wallach. Um, he was born as Heinrich Wallach in Germany, um, 1914 uh, in Berlin into a family of bankers, lived through the German hyperinflation and then emigrated with his family to the US in the 1930s, had a wonderful career as an economist, ended up as a, to be a Fed governor on the FOMC. And he still holds the record in terms of dissenting um, against the proposal of the chairperson saying, well, you guys don't understand, inflation is there, it will get at us, we need to be really careful, uh, we need to, you know, raise interest rates, etc. And um, that was decades later, that was a different country, that was a super educated, smart person who seems to be affected by what he experienced earlier in his life. Um, and that is not only him, so he's my favorite anecdote, but if you plot this graph, you just plot the forecast all FOMC members make twice a year to Congress in these monetary policy reports normalized by, by the Green Books against their lifetime experiences on the x-axis. Well, you don't need to do many econometric tests to see that there's a strong positive correlation. So people who given their birth year, that's one variation, was I born in 1940 or in 1960, um, given where I grew up, um, had, have seen higher inflation in their lifetime so far 
just tend to state that they think inflation will be higher than people who on average over their lifetime so far have seen lower price increases. And these are experts, these are, as far as I understand, people who on, on their desk have nothing but, you know, time series of inflation and models and stuff working with them to kind of uh, make the best possible forecast about inflation. In fact, famously, the staff often makes the better forecast um, than, and than the FOMC members and themselves, as my colleague, uh, uh, Christian David Roma, have pointed out. So how come that even um, experts who are highly informed about the variable we're interested in, so say inflation price changes today, are changed. Well, the way I'm thinking about it is that some kind of rewiring is happening. So um, I'm, I, I know there are people who really know about neuroscience and cognitive science uh, uh, in the audience, but let me give you my lay knowledge in a nutshell and then what I want to kind of utilize here. So I, what I want to, what the way I think about how this experience-based learning is happening um, relates most closely to what neuroscientists talk about um, when they talk, um, when they discuss synaptic tagging, or even there's emotional tagging. I might get to, get to later. So. Synaptic tagging, so again, my neuroscience in a nutshell, is as you know, as we walk through life and like uh, making new experiences, our brain forms these um, connections between the neurons. One is, you know, the, it's the uh, presynaptic one is firing the postsynaptic one and they're forming this connection, the synapses, which basically, you know, tells our body how to react, uh, to react to these experiences, the world around us, how we experience life. And what we know is that we, um, the brain is quite able to, you know, reorganize the pathways, forms new connections in response to what we're seeing around us uh, walking through our life. We always knew that this is um, something young brains can do a lot, you know, that's why we're trying to teach our kids all sorts of good stuff and give them certain experiences, but the brain never um, stops changing and everybody walking through life still has some um, plasticity. In particular, what matters is um, um, what a lot of recent research has been focusing on, I mean, going back maybe 20 years, but I've, I've you know, read a lot of a, a recent paper related to that, is how um, repeated stipul stimulation of neurons, particularly this uh, hippocampal neurons, which, which look like this um, uh, seahorse, um, can induce a prolonged effect, what's called long-term potentiation. And people, therefore, researchers increasingly have found results on um, the fact that it matters how we make an experience, so also the emotions which are kind of anchoring these experiences in our brain um, are important, and how often we make experiences. So repeated exposure, exposure um, while living through something with strong emotions have the potential to have a particular rewiring, re-altering or, or tagging um, effect, if you want to call it that way prior knowledge, right, what we economists are all about, all that matters is information, well, you know, has limited power to undo these effects or modify these effects. And um, for me, it has been quite informative to read literature on trauma, on how synaptic changes caused by uh, traumatic uh, stress are important to understand the rewiring in our brain. Now, some, going back to economics, you know, some of these events I've been talking about so far, um, like the German hyperinflation, like the Great Depression, I mean, clearly um, they can be thought about as trauma uh, or trauma with a big T, as, as some people call it. But I also want to point to trauma with a small T, that our daily exposure to price changes, our daily worry whether we're able to afford food, um, um, what unemployment will do to us, can live an, uh, leave an impact on us. And it might be even more subtle. I mean, I certainly grew up in a household where we didn't have to worry whether we have enough food on the table, but I had parents who were very concerned when the price of milk and butter was going up, um, very stereotypically German. And I do think that has left an impact on me. So I don't want to stretch trauma too much, but what is really um, powerful is that uh, this, this distinction about these big traumatic events, you know, being big enough to alter you in a way that's lasting for a long time translates exactly into what we're observing in economics. And also this, you know, small T trauma, these kind of daily exposure, these little, you know, paper cuts we get from all sorts of 
events happening to us leave a, 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 can accumulate to leave a long lasting impact. Um, one more thing on that, I keep emphasizing the negative aspects. Um, maybe, you know, we live in a pandemic. That's what I'm thinking about a lot uh, right now. But I do want to point out that we find similar aspects on the positive side. So somebody who's walked through life so far and seen mostly positive outcomes, we do see that the thinking gets altered in the direction of weighing these outcomes a lot, putting a lot of uh, weight on them. But so let me go to these daily exposures I'm talking about in some more detail right now. And um, that is in fact um, kind of the core of, um, um, of that paper I, I, I sent over associated with the talk today, um, which is um, relating our beliefs about economic outcome variables, such as price changes, um, price increases, inflation, to the environment we live in and the signals we observe around us. So first fact, um, if we look at, if you ask people, and when you um, think about, you know, what will happen with prices? What will inflation be next year? You know, will prices go up? Will everything become more expensive? What are you thinking about? Like what, what, what comes to your mind? Like based on what do you give your answer? And we gave people a lot of choices. This is a survey with um, Michael Weber at Chicago, Francesco da Kunto uh, at, at Boston College, and um, Michael's former PhD student, uh, Ospina, um, um, about, um, you know, it, it, all sorts of economic beliefs, including uh, beliefs about price increases. So we gave them 10 choices. Some are about people, family, friends, financial advisors, colleagues, maybe listen to what they say. A bunch are about media, social media, TV, radio, newspaper, online news, etc. And then there's also shopping, <laughs> your own shopping. And what turns out to be the case is that by the shopping is by far the most important source of information people are thinking about when we ask them about their um, inflation expectations. It, it's really interesting to zoom further into it. You know, it's in particular grocery shopping. And there's some interesting gender difference I get back to. So it's typically, you know, the bread, milk, butter. Men also think a lot about, but particular women, if you be a price is something men think more about than women. Um, but this is the overarching result. If we're, if you're thinking about prices, we think about our own shopping, the prices we have seen. And then you can do the following exercise. Once you've kind of taken that in, you can say, well, let me use the prices you have seen. And in this case, I'm going to be using the grocery bundles. Let me look at how much you spend um, a year ago on your daily grocery bundles. And let me see how these prices increase to the current year. So we're using this Tilts-Nielsen data, some of you know, to kind of in calculate kind of a household level CPI, a household level index of price increases you had to pay for. And then we group households into bins from those which had the lowest price increases, that's one here, all the way up to eight, which had the highest price increases. And ask these same people about the inflation expectation. What do you think general inflation in the US will be, you know, over the next 12 months? Well, again, you don't need many econometric tests to see that there has a highly positive correlation. So what I'm trying to say here is, when people think about where's the economy going, where will prices be going, etc just have this tendency to put a lot of weight of what we've personally experienced, of the signals we've personally seen around us. And, and by the way, to talk just a tiny bit about identification, that holds even within households. We, we did several waves, so it's not about rich households spending more than poor or things like this. If you live in a region where the milk increased more than people in another region, your inflation expectations go up than those of that other family in that other region. And it's sizable, so the low bin to high bin is about half a percentage point, given that we had very low inflation right now and have a target of 2%, this is a, you know, that's 25% of that target. So that's really powerful. One more thing, and I'm slowly running out of time here, I want to add is that this has also really interesting implications within households. So it's particular grocery prices we see. I mean, the other prices, gas prices are important. Of course, if you make big financial decisions on mortgages and so on, that plays into it. But a lot of people, you know, most of the time see grocery prices. And um, this can help us to better understand the long-standing puzzle that there's a gender difference in inflation expectations. So this is a related paper I have with Michael Francesco, uh, uh, Francesco da Kunt and Michael Weber uh, about gender roles and the gender expectation gap. 
Um, in effect, people have known that for a long while, uh, females tend to be more negative and experiencing higher inflation than males. Um, and we are the first to show that actually holds even within households. So this is data within households, um, the, the red is the females compared to the males. I mean, both have exaggerated inflation beliefs, but in particular, it's the females have perhaps these much higher inflation expectations. But then if you zoom in, I mean, you first control for staff, et cetera. And so then the difference goes back to about this 0.5% we, 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 we had before in the, in the bin comparison. But then you zoom in and distinguish between households where the man is not doing any grocery shopping versus the man is doing grocery shopping, you see it completely disappears in the latter and is entirely driven by the former. So this is, I think, I'm sad, but quite beautiful in demonstrating that where you put a person in, in their daily lives, has this big impact about how they think about the economy, how they think about prices in this case. And in the gender differences context, it's not only about, you know, glass ceiling restrictions and so on, can women do STEM and so on, no. Also the split up of, of household chores, uh, the, the, the world they live in will have this long lasting impact in terms of how they think about economic and financial variables. So let me sum up here. Um, um, what I hope I was able to convey with these little bits and pieces of, of our research is that daily exposure and its lifetime aggregation have a really significant impact, long-term impact on our beliefs and decision-making. You can think about the big T trauma events, macro shocks like the current crisis we're living through, which we predict to have long-term effects, even if you completely reestablish pre-crisis conditions, we will be out of but there's also small trauma, our daily environment um, will have a lasting impact on who we become, how we think about the world. This holds even for expert, highly informed, smart people like data of UCSF doctors, of central bankers, of uh, other financial experts. Um, it's not a question of intelligence, it's a question of rewiring. And my personal wish list for research on this is that we should collect more information about lifetime experiences and use it to understand why people have certain attitudes and make certain decisions. And I should stop here. Um, let me know if there are any questions. Well, Riki, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we have lots of questions from the audience and I'm going to be your, your moderator for the Q&A period. And I wanna start with a question from um, Kevin Volpe who started by saying that was a great presentation which I couldn't agree with more. Um, he wanted to know what your sense is of the age that might be key um, or in the key range for this idea of synaptic training and imprinting um, that leaves a longer term impact. And he also, he, it was a double question. So what age is sort of optimal to leave a lasting imprint? And also uh, what do you think COVID will do to us long term? Yeah, um, so, you know, to, 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 um, to tell you the truth in terms of what I believe, I have to go a little bit beyond uh, what my results um, say. So our results so far in terms of, you know, looking at these macro finance variables like inflation and stock market uh, beliefs, um, bond market participation, bond market beliefs, um, consumption, etc. cetera, um, our results um, were actually such that we didn't find a particularly you know, impressionable age. So we're always looking for the impressionable childhood years when, you know, there should be higher plasticity there is my understanding. Um, and we weren't quite able to identify that in our data yet. However, I do want to pose the caveat here that in terms of the outcome variables we're looking at, you know, these are variables that kick in later in your life in terms of your decision making. Um, and um, also we didn't always have the perfect data. So a bunch of these results I was showing you came from repeated cross-sectional data, which we're aggregating by cohort. So I have to be really, really careful. Nevertheless, I did find it interesting to, to kind of point out that even um, experiences later in life can have a large impact. It's not only what has been uh, emphasized in the labor literature, you know, the undergraduates graduating in this recession and, you know, where, where we have these long lasting effects. I mean, that's true, but it's really interesting to see that even later in life, we find these sizable, um, sizable impacts. Um, so that's one thing I would want to emphasize. Now, um, regarding the COVID-19 um, crisis, so basically in all the data sets I've looked at, um, there is kind of the same pattern emerging. Basically, 
you know, tell me your birth year, tell me today's date, um, and then the variable you're interested in, and then roughly speaking, way the experience the person has had with linearly declining weights. It's a little steeper, to be honest, like there's a little more recency bias, but roughly speaking. So in terms of COVID-19, you know, if we do have the vaccine by the end of the year and like magically all get our jobs back and job security and our wealth is minimally impacted and, you know, all this magical thinking, then, you know, it wasn't so long. So we, I, we would weigh, uh, you know, severity of impact for people, you know, who lost their job and so on, but also take into account that the duration was relatively short and maybe not have the largest impact. Um, it, it depends a little bit on the outcome variable you're looking at. So stock market in particular, so I'm, here I'm really going to go out and, and let's fingers crossed my, my prediction will be true, given that the stock market um, did fairly well, you know, for, for reasons we can talk about, I would expect that we won't see an impact on, on stock market investment. So this should just stay the same. And then in terms of um, um, job choices, uh, um, savings, etc., it depends on what industry um, you lived in. Um, one more thing in terms of age, I want to say, while I'm stressing that, um, you know, everybody is affected, I did gloss over a little bit the fact that, you know, it's always your lifetime experiences that matter. So naturally, if you're 60 right now, I mean, you're not liking this, but it's one sixtieth of your life. If you're a 22 year old who's just graduating, there's a big chunk of your life what's happening right now. So over the next five years, we do expect a much larger impact um, on, on, on the younger generation. Sorry, I went on to mute, which I'm learning is not a wise, not always a wise move. That was a great answer. Um, and actually a perfect follow up question from Ted O'Donoghue came in because you started touching on this in your answer. And he's curious if any of your data looks beyond at, at outcome variables besides um, stock market participation. He pointed out that most of your results are about beliefs and expectations. And so we might expect them to change many other decisions that people make um, in their lives. So curious if you have data on any of those other kinds of outcomes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I do a lot of research in finance, as Ted knows, and so my outcome variables tend to be in the macro finance realm so far, even though I would actually love, love, love to do more. I, I am doing some research on pandemics, including actually, you know, SARS and H1N1 and so on, and on people's perceptions of health and how they're often not in sync actually anymore with what's, what's going on with their real health. Um, but um, the ones where papers on, uh, I mean, definitely beyond stock market. So there is bond market experience and bond market um, um, investment, but there's also the decision to buy a house, which is one of the biggest financial decisions. And often people who worry about money becoming more and more worthless are more, because of inflation, say, are keener to put their money into a house. So like this, is not only in the US, we have European data, um, the paper with Alex Steine called Buy Versus Rent, where we show that these sharp differences in different uh, European countries, say France, you have people renting about 50, 40% of people are renting, the rest own the house. And in neighboring Spain, like 90% of people want to, I mean, own their, the house they live in. You can beautifully trace that back to past inflation experiences in, in that country. So it, it translates into the big financial decision of buying versus renting a house, conditional on buying, do you take a fixed rate mortgage versus a variable rate mortgage, which is often cheaper, but people who worry about increasing inflation and interest rates really don't like variable rate mortgages and often for, go a lot of money. And I've looked at um, consumption behavior. So it's really interesting to see that the paper with Leslie Shen called Scar Consumption. It's really interesting to see that if early in your life, either you personally were hit with unemployment or your family or even locally around you, unemployment rates were high, actually goes back to the pandemic question also before you tend to be more um, um, you need to you tend to be more worried about possibly not having enough money going forward and tend to become this really cautious spender you really see how they're accumulating um, um, accumulating savings for the rest of their life and are really careful in their spend in, in their spending so that's another one and it links with you know also beliefs again as, as, as Katie was saying about economic prospects and where you think the economy is going it's it's, it's very much in, in sync with that um, 
yeah, these are the variables I have so far. And I think there's much broader outcomes um, on health and job choices, how you view the world. And I, I would love for people to work on it or tell me what data I can use and I will work on it. <laughs> Oh, this is a really fascinating research agenda, as, and we have, you know, 30 questions waiting to be answered, so you can see there's a lot of excitement from our I'm attendees. <laughs> no, you don't, you don't need to go faster. I think it's better to do the deep dive, but I'm sorry to everyone whose questions we won't get to, but please keep them coming. They're, they're wonderful. Um, I'm going to jump to a question from um, Jerry Zhang. Jerry wants to know um, what you think about positive shocks. You've talked largely about negative shocks and how they change behavior, and he, he's curious if you think positive shocks would have a symmetric effect if you think it would be asymmetric, different in size. Yeah. Um, so going into this, I certainly thought it would be asymmetric. Um, I think also my core does, although I don't want to speak for them. Um, and um, although that might be our own experience effect, right? So we started this work during the financial crisis. Currently, we are during the pandemic. So maybe we are like all colored by that. In our data, I have to admit, it is pretty symmetric right now. So, so, you know, you can take boom times, people living through boom times and say in the stock market papers, they are pro stock market and willing to take financial risk, etc. And the consumption paper, they are spending more than they should be spending because, you know, think about the tech bubble, like early on, the people who just lived during good times, they were just spending outrageously much compared to our permanent income hypothesis life cycle consumption models. And um, so I've really found it to be in pretty, in, in every paper I've looked at to be symmetric. Um, I don't actually know whether, you know, the neuroscience supports that. I mean, what I have found is that the neuroscience often talks not just about trauma and the traumatic trauma-based encoding, but also emotion-based encoding. And that's this emotional tagging hypothesis I found. And that seems to go into both directions. But um, I have to admit that like my prior was definitely somewhere else. And I'm, um, it, I also want to acknowledge there's still the possibility that maybe finer data could find a difference. But for us so far in the data, it's uh, symmetric. That's really fascinating. And um, by the way, I think sometimes the most interesting results, right, are the ones that we aren't expecting because that really advances science. If, if our hypothesis is just confirmed, then we knew it already. Um, so that's really, really fascinating. Uh, here's another question that, that maybe will spur future research, but I'm also curious if it makes you think of anything you've already seen. Um, one of our participants, Rakim, Rakim, Rakimov, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, asked whether or not you think that the threat of climate change might have a disparate impact on people depending on whether they've been affected or expect to be, say if they're living in California or Australia uh, versus on the East Coast. Um, do you think that would change their decisions more or less? Uh, and, and have you seen any research or done any research on that? Yeah, um, totally. I, like, I think that's super fascinating. And that's also a little bit my hope you know, being very worried, living in California, being very worried about um, climate change myself, you know, I'm hoping to find these people who have been personally hugely affected and make sure they're agents for change. Um, so I, um, I've i seen people starting to send around surveys. I think Armin Falk out of break is doing like a bigger in initiative. In terms of research, what, what I have done or, um, together with um, um, uh, Troop Howard, a uh, student who's now assistant professor at, at, at the University of Utah just started. We've actually tracked members of Congress over the last years and we've looked whether they grew up in mostly like green areas where everything was fine versus areas where air pollution was more of a problem. And then we are trying to relate it to their vote on climate related uh, initiatives and that, that does look quite promising. So if you've seen the dark side of growing up, it does seem to be the case that you're more aware that something needs to be done about it. Um, this is still in progress, um, but I, I know other people are thinking about it. Um, I, maybe we haven't, none of us has the perfect data set yet. So uh, I think it's a great idea. I hope people will do that. That's wonderful. Um, I'm actually going to throw in a question for myself. I feel like I'm cheating by skipping the line, but um, I'm curious about how you think about the difference in the way people learn from experience versus description. Um, uh, Ido Evrev, whose work I'm sure you're familiar with, has done some really fascinating research on this in lab experiments, and you're focusing here clearly on experience. Uh, so I'm just wondering if, you know, if you think there are any interesting experiments in the field to be done related to that gap, or if you, uh, if you think his work relates to what you're seeing 
uh, and, and, you know, what you think prescriptively we can do about this? Yeah, so um, I have been super fascinated by how parallel these lab results are. So you, may, you, may, you mentioned the research of Aerith, and then even going back to like um, um, camera and whole like experience weighted learning. Um, this is much more, you know, shorter horizon. It's just a lab experiment, but it's just so similar in terms of how it works, right? Like I played this game and in this environment, this kind of strategy worked well. So I keep doing it, even though I've been informed that some of the parameters have changed. But it's just kind of, it's kind of ingrained in me that, that this works. And so I've been really fascinated how parallel they are and therefore been very tempted to, um, you know, like maybe venture a little bit more into the lab experimental world myself. Of course, there will always be this discrepancy that this research is about the long lasting effect. Like the point is like the crisis is over and decades later, you still see effects and you can't explain that with the standard variables. And so I'm not sure how far I can get with that to the lab. But one thing I have high hope, um, which is um, how about undoing some of them? So we are going to be careful. If you think about it from a preference perspective and somebody's just more risk averse, let that person be more risk averse. But for a lot of my variables, as, as you and, and um, I think also Ted in his question initially pointed out, it tends to go through belief. So like say, take the stock market. I just see some bad stuff happen in the stock market. People become super pessimistic. And as a result, shy away from the stock market, even when they're young and should, you know, save for retirement in a broadly diversified way and they're just not doing it like uh, for 20, 30 years and they're finally coming back to it. And I wish I could speed that up. So some cases where really, you know, like we hope that like we are pretty sure that we've identified a mistake and we are pretty sure this will come back once the person has accumulated enough good experiences. Can we speed that up? And so what I have been trying to explore, but I haven't been uh, successful yet, maybe because I'm not as much of a lab experimentalist, is um, find a setting where we can kind of do simulated experiences, right? Like scenario development or something like this. Uh, let people play on the stock market, the stock market game, where based on historical rates, we draw you know, outcomes, you choose some hypothetical investment, give them even some pay to make it incentive compatible or something, if, 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 if the organization allows. Let's see whether that might help with kind of speeding up a realization that that was a one-time experience that's not going to be representative and people taking it in more. Um, maybe even with virtual reality and so on, and there, there could be beautiful ways of making this quite the experience. And I think there's huge potential there. Wonderful. Well, I actually think that's a perfect place to end with two minutes left um, because it leaves us on an, sort of an optimistic note about future research and uh, cross-pollination is part of BCFG. So it was exciting that you uh, see the lab as such a fruitful area for further inquiry. Um, thank you for being our guest. This has been absolutely wonderful. It was great to have, you know, nearly 750 participants uh, log in at different points for this talk. And I just wanted to let folks know that we hope many of you will join us again next week. Uh, next week, we have Eli Finkel, who will be our speaker, uh, joining us from Northwestern University, a, a really talented psychologist who studies relationships. And, um, and we're so grateful to Ulrike. Ulrike, thank you for being here and being such a wonderful guest. This was fascinating. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Thanks for the really excellent questions. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> wonderful. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. Bye-bye.